Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, sorry that we're starting a little bit late, uh, but it's pouring outside, so we wanted to give people a few minutes to actually get here. Um, I want to welcome you to this, the second of uh, two interrelated events on addressing anti-black racism and speaking to black agency locally and indeed nationally. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this event is being held on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Mosquian peoples. Um, and it's been held at a time when the Wet'suwet'en people, their traditional leaders and elders, and other land defenders are negotiating with national and provisional governments about issues of representation, nation to nation. Uh, it's not just about a pipeline, folks. <laughs> My name is Handel Kashapé Wright. I'm a professor of education at UBC. Um, I'm co-founder and uh, co-director of the Center for Culture, Identity, and Education. I'm a founding member of the UBC Black Caucus. I'm a founding member of the Black Canadian Studies Association. And I'm mentioning these because they're all related to what will be said today, not to go on about myself. And I'm a member of um, its, I was a member of its interim executive. And I serve on the mayor of Vancouver's Black History Month Advisory Committee. So um, today we're speaking out about black activism in education and community, uh, asserting black presence locally and indeed nationally. And this panel is supposed to really begin to get at the links between uh, activism and education between university and community, uh, addressing anti-black racism and asserting black presence. Uh, we spent the first event addressing the very serious problem of anti-black racism locally and nationally, and we're so grateful that Shelby McPhee was able to come uh, and be willing to share his story with us, a very painful experience, and that was racism uh, as a teaching moment. But black people are not merely victims of racism, as serious and pervasive as that problem is. And we are indeed part of the solution to that problem. Uh, many are hard at work in addressing it. And we do work well beyond addressing anti-black racism, including intellectual, artistic, and academic contributions, which in their own way are very much a rebuke to anti-black racism. So this second panel is about that work, that black community activism, that black creative work, um, the struggle for recognition and empowerment, uh, allyship work with others, including indigenous folks. So it's about asserting a black presence in Canada. And every one of you who does activism or observes things knows that this work is two steps forward and one step back. And the steps that this year I'm sort of encouraged that UBC has several efforts that it's been making, including the UBC Lint series, which has brought academics and public intellectuals from the US uh, to campus. The Equity and Inclusion Office at UBC has worked uh, together with the, the, we've had the formation of the Black Caucus. Um, the, the UBC Equity Office has worked with us and the Black Caucus to put on events such as this. Um, we've had black musical celebrations at the Chan Center. Just this Saturday, um, there was a wonderful concert on We Shall Overcome, musical celebration of Martin Luther King and a pre-event interview that I did with Gospel Powerhouse uh, Marcus Mosley, and that was initiated by uh, Minel Notani, who's advisor to the provost on racialized faculty at UBC. Um, folks, uh, today we have with us uh, four incredible uh, speakers. Um, two of them at least, if not all of them, many of you should know. Um, and folks can say more about who they are and their work, because I want to introduce them and then uh, introduce uh, also our keynote speaker. 
um, on my far left, your right, uh, is Kona, who is uh, generally a passionate activist on various issues. Um, and she does uh, uh, address issues of including indigenous allyship, uh, working with black folks' health and well-being, issues of anti-poverty. And um, for each person, I want to mention why I've invited them to be um, uh, on this panel. Um, in January, there was a discussion on Meanwhile Black in Vancouver, which is the online black community, about sexuality issues and the need for an inclusive politics that fully incorporates uh, queer black Vancouver. I read some of the exchanges, and after a short while, some of the problematic statements just made me tune out. But I noticed that Kona stuck through with it mm -hmm. and engaged people and continued to work with this. Um, and she came up with a final statement which has resonated so much with me that in some ways, for me, this is how I choose to introduce her. Um, and for her, it was an offhand comment, but for me, it was so knowledgeable and so meaningful because I don't usually work with numbers. But here's what she said. She said, we, live, we have to live in this city together. The population of BC is five million people. The population of Metro Vancouver is 2.5 million people. The population of Vancouver is 675,000 people. We, meaning black people, are 46,000 people in the whole province. We are 30,000 people in Metro Vancouver. BC Place in downtown Vancouver holds 54,500 people. We cannot afford to hurt each other. We must ensure that each one of us survives slash thrives. And I think... Yes. <laughs> and I think that was such such um, a, a profound statement that I would consider it a, a, a piece of the pedagogy of activism, mm -hmm. one that reaches way beyond each one, teach one. Um, and next, and, and both uh, Kona and Barbara, I don't know that we should be going through introductions, but I, you know, we will anyway. Um, <laughs> if there's some rock under which you were located and don't know Kona and you don't know Barbara. So here's some of the nitty gritty on Barbara. Um, uh, Barbara Chirios is founder and co-curator of the Vancouver International Film Festival uh, and the Film Festival's uh, Black History Month film series. She was curator and producer of the Battered Women Support Series event 40 years later. She served as executive director of the Granville Island Cultural Societies um, and was gala producer of special events and facilitator manager for Van City Theater. Um, and Barbara Kona and I have served on the mayor of Vancouver's advisory on Black History Month. In fact, Kona, I think, was one of the people who initiated this, yeah. uh, this work several years ago. So With these Parker are the. Uh, uh, together with our own Parker, Parker Johnson, of course, who's there in the front row. So, um, and then we have, uh, so th that's part of the reason why. So uh, Kona and, uh, and Barbara for that link with creativity, because something I found out recently about Kona is that uh, she was an actor too. So that creative part is a link they both have as well. So, um, Olu, uh, Olu Dulapo Makinde um, is the other speaker that we have with us. She's a member of the UBC Black Caucus, so that's the Black Caucus represented, and a PhD student at the Allard School of Law, her ongoing research for which she has received, recently received the Allard Scholar Graduate Fellowship Award investigates how corporate governance tools yeah. can be effectively applied to address systemic um, corruption in state-owned enterprises. Um, she worked as a legal associate specializing in corporate and commercial law 
at Kenna Partners in Lagos, Nigeria, before coming here, of course. And there are other things I could say about her, but the main reason why she's on the panel is because she has that connection with the Black Caucus. She's representing the Black Caucus in some ways. But also principally because she did a report that I absolutely love, and if you have not read it, you should read it. Um, it's, it's titled Towards a Healthy City, Addressing Anti-Black Racism in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And this was work she did um, between UBC and the City of Vancouver's Social Policy and Projects Department. So there's that link that ought to be made between university folks and community folks. Um, so uh, those are the three, apart from myself, and I won't say much um, <laughs> about myself, apart from myself. So uh, I think we, now, I now want to introduce um, our keynote speaker. Um, there's a lot I could say about her, <laughs> but she has warned me not to go through her bio, so I, I won't, I'll resist. But I will mention that um, the things that might not be that prominent in her bio are very prominent for me and for us. Uh, Omosore Dryden is the co-president of the Black Canadian Studies Association. Um, I won't give you the kind of academic stuff. I'll say this, the more um, lay stuff and more activist part of her work. Uh, Dr. Omisore Dryden is an interdisciplinary scholar who examines the symbolics of blood and the social life of blood donation while engaging with black queer diasporic analytics, health and medical humanities. Dr. Dryden is the principal investigator of a research project that seeks to identify the barriers African slash black gay, bisexual and trans men encounter to donating blood in Canada. Uh, funded by the Canadian Blood Services MSM Research Grant Program, her project analyzes how anti-black racism, colonialism, and sexual exceptionalism shapes the blood system in Canada. And the main reason why I've been, um, well, she and I were in discussion before the conference at which um, Shelby was you know, um, attacked. And she got in touch and said, oh, Handel, I'm coming to Congress. We should meet up. And I, and I said, yes, we should definitely meet up, have a coffee, whatever. And, uh, and then we never did meet up. Because the Shelby thing happened. Because the thing happened. And then she later wrote to me and said, oh, I might come to Vancouver at some point. And I said, we have to nail this down. <laughs> and AFTAB was already working on the stuff with Shelby, and I just said we could attach this, and she has been so generous as to actually be here. And it's ironic, before she starts, I just wanted to mention this, that the Black Canadian Studies Association was started in 1999, I believe, and started here um, in Vancouver at SFU. And we held a conference every year Apart from the Congress, it was a space where we could do our own thing as black scholars. And when we finally decided to join Congress, this is what happened, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and the other position you hold is the James R. Johnston Chair in Black Canadian Studies in the Faculty of Medicine. <laughs> um, at uh, Dalhousie University. Wouldn't it be nice if UBC had such a thing? <laughs> a chair in black Canadian studies. We can only salivate. <laughs> uh, and, and I wanted that to be on display here too in Vancouver to say, we don't have that, and why not? Mm -hmm. So if we have that somewhere in the country, we can bring somebody like her. Yes. So with that as a kind of informal introduction, I want to invite you to, um, to, to join me in welcoming all the panelists for today. And more specifically, to invite um, uh, Dr. Dryden to give us an address. And the way we'll proceed is 
she'll give an address much more substantial. She's come all the way from Dalhousie. And then uh, folks around here, probably excluding me, might have five minutes to speak to their work to assert something about black activism uh, in Vancouver locally. And then we'll have substantial time for a discussion about these issues. And there might be cue cards going around um, that you can write down a question you might want to ask, and, uh, and we can do the Q&A that way. So with that, um, please, um, Dr. Dryden. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> you good? Are you dry? <laughs> You know, I lived in Vancouver for about, I don't know, 30 seconds. Um, and during that time, Vancou at the time, Vancouver had broken its record for the most amount of d days without direct sunlight and <laughs> rainfall. And it was a lot. That's all I'm saying. Um, so it's great to be here. Thank you to Handel Wright for the generous invitation to the UBC Black Caucus, the Center for Cultural Identity and Education, the Equity and Inclusion Office. Um, thank you to Asmin uh, for your assistance with the logistics and support for my travels. And I'm thrilled to be in conversation with my fellow panelists. And I want to give out a special shout out to my sister Kona. Um, we've known each other, well, only we need to know that. Mm -hmm. um, and through that time, you have and remain and continue to be fire. So mm -hmm. Thank you. it's great to do this with you. Thank you. So I have notes, because as academics, this is the only way to try and keep us in some kind of time limit. Um, but also, I, I hope what I'm saying actually makes some sense and resonates. So I acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples on whose unceded territory we meet, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, um, Tsleil-Waututh Sle yeah. Sle nations. I currently work and live in Chibuktuk, Halifax, the traditional unceded territories of the Maliseet, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. Roughly 140 years before the end of slavery in Canada. I was raised in London, Ontario, the territory of the Chippewa of the Thames, the Oneida of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation, and spent the majority of my life in Toronto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. August 2019 marked 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade's beginnings. So what does this mean? It means that black people have been in North America for, and this is a conservative estimate, about 400 years. I think we assume that black people only came to North America, including this region we currently call Canada, through slavery. But this is simply not true. Black people have been here before slavery, through slavery, and of course after slavery. Thus, if we are committed to disrupting colonialism, if we are committed to an anti-colonial practice, we must acknowledge black people, period. Genocide has not erased indigeneity of the people of Turtle Island, even, through practices of, even though practices of genocide continue. Neither has slavery removed, um, so genocide has not erased the indigeneity of people of Turtle Island, even though practices of genocide continue. Neither has slavery removed the indigeneity of black people, even though many of us are doubly displaced from our own traditional territories as we continue to live in this afterlife of slavery. If colonization of the Americas begins in land theft and the compromising of indigenous bodily autonomy, for black people it begins with our bodily theft and removal from lands we can no longer claim. In short, colonization begins for us with the attempted theft of our indigeneity. So I take this time to acknowledge the black folks who made home in and amongst indigenous communities, sometimes welcomed, other times shunned, I think of the communities around London, Ontario, known to us now as Chatham, Dresden, Buxton. 
Halifax was imposed in and on and within Chibuktuk in 1749, and enslaved indigenous African people were used to dig out the roads and build the city, including much of the citadel. On the southern shore of the Bedford Basin, Mi'kma'ki folks shared land with black people, and this allowed Africville to be founded in the mid-1800s. I acknowledge black folks who made home in Salt Springs in, col in collaboration with and perhaps at odds with the Sa Saanich, Kawashan, and Chimanias, yes, yes, First Nations, and black folks who made home and were then displaced from Hogan's Alley. In this acknowledgement, I honor black and indigenous people who continue to be here, who continue to fight against genocide and the afterlives of slavery. I respectfully acknowledge our collective ancestors, indigenous, black, queer, trans, genderqueer, and two-spirit, who were born here, forced here, and continue to make home here. Ashe. So I've been asked to speak on responses to anti-black racism, to some of the work to shift, survive, and disrupt these realities. I'll do this through sharing some stories and information, but to get there, it's necessary to explore the climate, or as Christina Sharp articulates, the weather, in which we work, live, and study. So yes, I am currently the James R. Johnson Chair in Black Studies in the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie. This is a six-year appointment. James Robinson Johnston was an African Nova Scotian man and in 1896 became the first African Nova Scotian person to earn a degree from Dalhousie, Dalhousie in law. In fact, he was the first African Nova Scotian person to graduate from any university. He also became the first black person to practice law in Nova Scotia. Mr. Johnston provided legal counsel and services across the province of Nova Scotia, providing legal representation to many. He died tragically in 1915, just days before his 39th birthday. I know, right? Um, his March 12th, we're gonna, I'm hosting an event for the descendants of his family. We're gonna have a reception and talk about how to acknowledge um, his work and his legacy you know, during the life of the, my life in the chair. In 1991, nearly a century after Mr. Johnston studied at Dalhousie and in honor of his many accomplishments and also in recognition of the historical presence of African Nova Scotian people, Dalhousie University established the James R. Johnston Chair in Black Canadian Studies. At that time, it was the only endowed Black Studies Chair at a Canadian university. The inaugural J.R.J. Chair was Esmeralda Thornhill, a lawyer, in the Faculty of Law, the same faculty from which Mr. Johnston graduated. Professor David Devine, the second chair, was hosted in the School of Social Work. Dr. Fua Cooper, the third chair, was situated in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So Dr. Cooper, Professor Devine, and Dr. Thornhill have each made unique contributions to the animation of the chair and to the field of black studies in Canada. Their work is simultaneously diasporic, transnational, and transhistorical. They have demonstrated that black studies both addresses the epistemic dilemma Eurocentrism makes of blackness, but also understanding that blackness is relational and situating black activism and intellectual life as intimately connected. My appointment to the chair in the Faculty of Medicine adds to, continues, and furthers the conversations engaged in by previous chairs, and I honor their work. I also honor that having a chair in black studies that moves through faculties actively demonstrates the interdisciplinarity of the field alongside its multi-method theoretical interventions. Black studies is rooted in rad radical political and activist movements. Thus, community participation is a significant um, cornerstone of the work of the chair. In fact, community participation was integral in the appointment process. So in essence, the community got to interview us. This is important to note as we speak about responses to anti-black racism, to some of the work to shift, survive, and disrupt these realities. Black studies is simultaneously theory, method, and activist practice. My interest and commitment to black life in Canada is about the disruption and rupture of the Canadian colonial project, anti-black racism and the afterlife of slavery in Canada. As a discipline, black studies is rooted in a radical movement committed to fundamental educational reform. It seeks to disrupt in erroneous information and produce more accurate knowledge, less racist knowledge. 
Black studies in, is particularly important in Canada. For many people here, the presence of black people is both unimaginable and unexpected. The presence of black people is often met with surprise. And we see the surprise when people need to know where we're really from. Like, really? Where are you really from? Really? OK, so where are your parents from? Really? When decision makers and policymakers cannot imagine black people as being authentic, credible, or legitimate members of the country, of the community, of the department, of the university, we are erased and left out to our detriment. In academia, we would call this practice coming to terms with, the, with coming this practice, coming to terms with the presence of black people in Canada, an epistemic dilemma. We're knowledge, we're knowledge that is, we are knowledge that is difficult to grapple with, that seems too impossible. And as we know, anti-black racism is not experienced the same by everyone. Black women, black men, black children, black lesbians, black gay men, black bisexual people, black trans people, black queer people. We have unique experiences with anti-black racism. Canada's enduring national narrative of multiculturalism makes it difficult for anti-blackness to be understood as endemic to and within the fabric of the nation. Claims of culture and racial neutrality, and in my research I pay particular um, attention to fields of medicine and health, claims of cultural and racial neutrality hamper our ability to fully outline the barriers encountered by black people. Hat tip. Beware of the friend, community member, colleague, professor, administrator who proudly claims that they don't see color. You in danger, girl. You in danger. I came across, oh, finally, I came across this image. When working at a small university in Sudbury, Ontario, this candid, unposed photo by Scott Schumann is an entire mood. And an important image when thinking through black life and black presence. Presence, the state or fact of existing, occurring, or being, in pres being present in a place or thing. Then we also think, need to think about presence as describing a person or a thing that exists or is present in a place but is not seen, not detected, not recognized, not noticed. This is the double meaning of presence. Inclusion does not necessarily disrupt these types of invisibilities. Hope of inclusion, legal, political, social, um, and this commitment to securing inclusion does not ultimately disrupt the anti-black practices, generally of homophobia, of sexism, of ableism, nor has securing legal and civil rights shifted the anti-black practices of erasure. This is made evident through the use of diversity and inclusion policies, practices, and discourse. The use of dis diversity is a strategy that serves to manage normativity, harmony, and civility, but ultimately does not facilitate a disruption of systems of oppression. The baseline in the work of in diversity is maintaining the status quo. Diversity work produces a culture of silence and, in effect, attempts to gesture to more diversity than actually exists. And here I'm in conversation with Melinda Smith and Sarah Ahmed. The deployment of multiculturalism suggests that the nation is established within um, and maintains goodwill. Thus, when we raise issues of anti-black racism, not only are we positioned as disgruntled and unappreciative of the nation and its commitment to tolerance through the neoliberal narratives of multiculturalism, we are also pathologized as being obsessive and compulsive about racism, unable to control our thoughts about racism. It becomes part of that colonial trajectory of Samuel Cartwright. In 1851, Samuel Cartwright, a white physician, hypothesized that the cause of enslaved indigenous African people fleeing captivity was in fact due to their mental illness, drapetomania. Canada's enduring espousal of multiculturalism makes it difficult for anti-black anti racism to be understood as endemic to and within the fabric of Canadian nation making. And as I've discussed elsewhere, history shows how the white supremacist colonial state of Canada strategically desires our inclusion at times to further its colonial agenda only to exclude us to sustain its racist anti-black agenda. I understand that the desire to be recognized and included is quite powerful, and this desire can and tends, can lead to the types of hegemonic bargains that continue to support the very system that is in need of rupture. And I get it. 
right? You know, there, there will always, so again, I work in medicine and health. There will always be black people who want to be doctors, who are willing to travel great distances to make this happen. For this reason, the neoliberal interventions of inclusion are important. It is necessary to disrupt the barriers preventing black people from medical studies and all other studies, grad studies, undergraduate studies, employment, right? All, under, all other types of um, studies. Uh, fields, and it is imperative to implement practices and programs that will support black people throughout the medical school process, including residencies. Perhaps we can call um, inclusion policies and practices a form of harm reduction. The implementation of policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize the negative impacts of anti-black racism. To draw on the literature of harm reduction, it is understood to be grounded in justice and human rights, focusing on um, positive change and with working um, with people without judgment, coercion, and discrimination. The harm reduction in this case, then, is not focused on minimizing behavior of black people, right? It's not about our continued surveillance. It must be focused on the systems of anti-black racism in which our schools exist and in which our schools have been developed. Right? Education and university in Canada was created before the end of slavery. So we can't then assume that universities today are somehow not um, informed through its creation through a time of slavery. Right? Uh, Dr. Fu Cooper just finished doing a report called the Lord Dal Report. Lord Dalhousie, for whom Dalhousie is named, was a slave owner. And so they went through many of his, uh, of his archive and drew this trajectory between that time and, and the systemic issues that are impacting Dalhousie today. It's online. Google it. Dal, Lord Dal Afua Cooper. It'll pop up. However, simply being included in this already established colonial system is not enough. Colonialism and systemic anti-black racism create the structures. So recently, and we see this, colonialism and anti-black racism create the structures that allow for, say, a single black student in a grad course, or a single black student to be admitted into medical school, or um, to have all white short, short lists, <laughs> or to have one black person in a department, right? More structural interventions are required. Diversity of color does not mean, always mean diversity of thought. So the system will have us tied up in knots, believing that there is a good, that there is goodwill to fix a system that was structured and constructed through and within colonial and anti-black structures. Having us spend time attempting to tweak a system, believing that it can be redeemed. But if we think of working in these systems as forms of harm reduction, then perhaps we can shift our own gaze to think of more radical and revolutionary forms of black life that exist, grow, and thrive beyond these limited and limiting systems. Perhaps this is the role of Afrofuturism. Formal complaints of racial harassment and discrimination are rarely taken seriously or addressed effectively. We still work in a system where we state that black people are harassed, discriminated against, excluded because we are black or because of the color of our skin. And this is simply just not the case. Black people are harassed, discriminated against, and excluded because, excluded because of white supremacy and anti-black racism. Formal complaints get lost or set aside. The realities are that racism is largely treated as only a misunderstanding, not ever intentional, or done on purpose, or done deliberately. Thus shifting the focus to interrogate, thus shifting the focus to interrogate how we brought these actions on ourselves. I recently spoke out about Santina Rao, an African Nova Scotian woman who was physically assaulted by Halifax cops in a Walmart um, in Halifax and received a, um, and she had her arm broken. She, she was accused of stealing while she was still in the store shopping. Um, and we can, I can tell you more about that. So I spoke out about it in a Halifax paper. <laughs> and the next day, the day it was released, I received a hate phone call from a person from Calgary. Like seriously, the commitment to call long distance to my work phone to say hateful things, but okay. So I, I wrote about that on Facebook and a Facebook contact said I should reach out to the university as they are to protect me. And technically this, technically this is true. I'm sure, I'm sure, 
Um, there are a number of policies and laws that dictate that my employer is responsible for my safety. But this is never just a, hey, look, this racist thing happened to me. Instead, it's, hey, look, this racist thing happened to me, and the system responding with, well, we don't know yet that it's racist, so slow your roll. Let's investigate so we can make sure. And in the end, maybe if you're lucky, false apologies, claims of unconscious bias um, are the most that the system tends to offer. To be clear, if the system requires that racism must be proven in order to have effective interventions, how does one go, go about proving the existence of racism in the classroom, on the job, within the police and medical system, when living in a colonial system that does not recognize racism? <laughs> true talk. Yeah, all right, okay. Too much? No. All right, okay, Barely okay. Enough. Okay. Oh, you want me to go, go you want me to go hard? I'm like, go in, go in. Uh, okay, okay. You don't live here, so it's great. I know. <laughs> but I'm I might like, want to come hard. back and see people. <laughs> I'm gonna see people and I will back you in the street. <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap up because I want us to talk. Okay? I want us to talk. So in Audre Lorde's essay, Scratching the Surface, some notes on barriers to women and loving, she states, and I quote. It is axiomatic that we define ourselves for ourselves, or we will be defined by others for their use and to our detriment. And I carry this with me everywhere. It was my opening epigraph to my dissertation. It will be part of my half sleeve. It, will, it, is, it, is, it has carried me for many, many years. So what are the radical roots of black studies? What else can we imagine in relation to education through black radical thought? How do we account for the afterlife of slavery in the Canadian context? Uh, in Canada and in the Canadian context of education. How do we ensure that black lives matter? In um, an article titled Towards a Black Feminist Health Science Studies, they are, um, it is argued health and wellness, again my field is in my field of research, health and wellness must be seen as an integral part of social justice labor. This means working within, with, with and within communities of activists. And I use the word activist here on purpose. While this may be off-putting for some of us, more comfortable, uh, who are more comfortable with being positioned as advocates, I insist on the use of the word and practices of activism. I believe that the management of our lives, not merely presence in both senses of the word, would look differently if we centered and then deployed social justice as our guide, out loud and without apology. So I'll stop there so we can talk. Um, thanks so much. Um, the, you've brought up so many different things. Um, I'm sure each of the panelists has um, something they want to bring to this. As I was listening to you, um, at several points came, came to mind. Um, the, the ways in which anti-black racism acts upon us, and it acts so differently upon us, and sometimes the way we, even black folks, don't want to get too much into what our differences are. And we do need to get into that mm -hmm. um, in order to know how to address it. Which is mm -hmm. part of why I, I wanted this kind of variety on this, uh, uh, on this panel. And, uh, and institutional racism and the way it works and the limits to how we can address it different from, right? And the fact that in a way, I, yourself, other people do a form of, people want to separate always community mm -hmm. folks and their activism mm -hmm. and academic folks, right? Mm -hmm. And there are ways in which both sides want to dismiss aspects of the work of the other. And I think it's really important for us to really begin to talk about academic activism mm -hmm. uh, and the real organic links that exist in some people's world between the academy and the community. Mm -hmm. And um, and BCSA is so illustrative of that. It's, it's then what we thought of. The, we never thought of ourselves as doing purely academic work from the beginning, right? So it, it reminds me about African literature in a way. Some people said um, African writers cannot afford uh, the, the, the kind of idea of the writer in the attic. You, you're always engaged in community mm -hmm. uh, inextricably, right? So, and you mentioned uh, uh, Africville, which you should, of course, 
but it's wonderful to see somebody come from over there and mention Hogan's Alley. Yes. At the first anti-black racism conference that was held uh, in this country in Toronto, I asked people, I gave one of the plenary addresses, how many people know about Africville? Everybody, all the black folks raised their hands and waved. And I said, and Hogan's Alley, and said, where, who? Right? So we need more of that. We are here in a place where we're almost negligible in terms of uh, our numbers. Um, but there are strong folks here who are doing the work. One of them sitting there, <laughs> three of them are up here, right? And so I want to invite them to say, you know, something about their work in response to you or just about their own work and about activism, about their connection to all of this stuff, a way of asserting our presence uh, rather than just, oh, well, there's anti-black racism. So. Whoever wants to start. Don't look down at this end of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at this stack of paper here and I'm wondering what you have to say. Do you want to go now? You've got this beautiful thing that I think you might read. Um, okay, I can go next would if you, that's would okay. You? Do, you feel, do you feel pushed into going now? No, it's okay. All right, okay. <laughs> <Good. laughs> I'm like, what are the academics <laughs> got to say? <laughs> Okay, um, so my name is Dola Bo. As Handel introduced me earlier, I'm a PhD student at the Allard School of Law. And some, at, uh, during summer last year, I had the opportunity to work as a healthy city scholar under the Sustainability Scholars Program organized by UBC with the city of Vancouver. Um, I worked with my mentor, Ipil Samtayo Freitag, at the oh. Social Policy and Projects Department on this project titled um, Towards a Healthy City Addressing Anti-Black Racism in Vancouver. I got the opportunity to meet a lot of um, community mem members like Parker Johnson who contributed a lot to this project. Um, I you know, also got to work with the team at the Social Policy Department um, in putting forward recommendations. Um, just to give a brief um, overview of what the project um, was about, so the city of Vancouver has what's called the Healthy City Strategy, and one of the goals contained in that strategy is to ensure that all Vancouverites feel safe and included. So the question was, the black community you know, forms a part you know, of the, you know, Vancouver, so how do they feel? Do they feel safe and included? So that was the question the city wanted to answer. So I was brought on board that project you know, to do more research on this question and um, put forward recommendations that the city could run with going forward. So, I must first say that when I, when I took on this project, um, not only was I new to Vancouver, I was new to being black because um, yes. I'm, I'm a Nigerian. I came from Nigeria. Yes. Um, so it was a new experience for me. It was a learning experience. And that's why this project was very important to me because mm -hmm. it was part of my learning experience, learning what it meant to be black you know, in mm -hmm. Vancouver, you know, specifically and within the broader Canadian context. So. Um, just to uh, run through some of my findings and the content in my reports. Um, so when I did a literature review, um, I read reports, I read um, journal articles that have been written, I read newspaper articles on the subject. And one of the things I realized is, you know, as black people, we face a lot of discrimination and marginalization in, ver in various aspects. When you look at, you know, in terms of housing, we, uh, we talk about Hogan's Alley today, you know, that was, um, uh, demolished between 1967 and 1971 due to the then popular urban renewal projects going on. Um, and even till today, we know that's lacking because we don't have that black community here in Vancouver any longer because of that um, um, urban renewal drive then. If you also look at it, um, in addition to indigenous people, you know, black people also account for uh, about 45% of those who are homeless within Vancouver. When you talk about, um, when you talk about criminal justice system, we're also you know, overrepresented in prisons across Canada. Um, in terms of income earnings, you know, black people are recorded to have the highest, um, um, the highest, um, uh, the lowest earning wage you know, compared to other ethnic groups. Um, in terms of education too, when you look at education, we see that not only are we, um, not, only, not only do we see that um, curriculum and pedagogy don't talk about the history of slavery and marginalization that has been you know, part of Canadian history. Most people don't recognize that slavery was a part of Canadian history. No, um, we also don't rec recognize the contribution of, the contribution of African Canadians to um, Canadian history. 
And in addition to that, there are instances or incidences of you know, anti-black racism that occurs in schools, in high schools, in universities, that um, often don't go you know, addressed. They, they, you know, they, it often leads to um, very um, you know, unconclusive um, un um, 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 findings or proper steps are not taken to address the issue. So these various things, you know, these various aspects where we face discrimination and challenges you know, makes it very, very difficult to um, you know, to be, uh, you know, to, and to live a, a, a life, a full life here as a black person in Vancouver. Uh, that's even on one hand, when we now also take on the other ident identities, you know, um, in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality, in terms of um, HIV status, disability, all those things, once all of those things intertwine, we see that it's even more difficult and that we often have this low quality of life. So I looked at all those and I saw that this, is, this has been a narrative. I mean, a lot of reports have been put out there on what has been going on. But then the question was, what exactly is the city of Vancouver doing about this? What's going on? So my next line of action was to look at you know, the city's policies, what's going on. And from my review, I found that the city um, had some ongoing work if you look at the current work on the equity framework, equity framework is currently being developed, and the idea behind that is to, um, you know, enhance equity, inclusion, and diversity of all of all persons you know, from all ethnic groups, but with particular focus on indigenous and black people. Um, it will also look at the creative city strategy, which also has some, you know, content about the need to promote and, you know, have more anti-black racism trainings. Those are really fine developments. Then we also look at the North East Falls Creek Plan, which talks about the revitalization of Hogan's Alley. That's in the works. That's, you know, starting up. So the city has, you know, some um, measures here and there, you know, in place to address this issue. But that's okay. Uh, then I decided to look at what other munis municipalities um, across Canada and you know other uh, North American um, countries are doing, particularly the U.S. So I looked at Halifax, I looked at um, New York, I looked at quite a number of other state or munis municipalities. But suffice to say that uh, even though there were some form of measures put in place across these various um, municipalities, the only um, the only municipality for um, that had a holistic you know measure in place to address anti-black racism was Toronto mm -hmm. uh, because they have uh, they have a specific anti-black racism action plan which was developed you know by the city in conjunction with staff black staff members of the community they all came together to develop a, a comprehensive action plan which covers a wide range of areas from youth development black leadership um, you know policing criminal justice system, income earnings and support. So it's a very comprehensive plan, you know, which they, they are, they're working on. And they, they also established um, a unit, a team, that was responsible for implementing the plan and also reporting on that, on the implementation of the plan to council. So even though I make several recommendations in my report, which is available online, if you just Google addressing anti-black racism in Vancouver, you, you probably find it. It's on the Sustainability Scholars website. So even though I make a lot of recommendations you know, that I gain from talking to various community members, city staff, uh, members of the community generally, um, my main recommendation to the city was to set up, was to draw inspiration from the city of Toronto's action plan and set up something specific to address anti-black racism in Vancouver. So that was my main um, suggestion to the city. And the reason for this is primarily because if you look at the UN Working Group of Experts on, on People of African Descent, they issued a report in 2016 that, you know, where they made two very profound statements. The first being that um, they recognized that the um, that the African the African Canadians should be recognized as a distinct group whose human rights should be protected and promoted. That's because of the history of slavery and marginalization that has been meted out to you know to 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 Africans in Canada. They also mentioned that the term visible minority often obscures the the varying treatments you know, that Africans have gone through in Canada and that there's a need to, add, to put in place specific measures to address anti-black racism. So the City of Toronto's action plan builds on that report. So we also can draw inspiration from that report to specifically address you know, the issue of anti-black racism. Um, and I recently le learned that um, about, I think it was in December, that's, um, sit this, well, I made my recommendations to council. I was also uh, able to present my, my findings to the city leadership um, sometime in September, October, and I learned that around December that they've approved funding for the project. So there's gonna be some, you know, 
work done, actual work, because they've, they've already set aside money to, also, to work on an anti-black racism policy or strategy, and I'm hoping that you know, in the nearest future, uh, they'll be reaching out to um, black, the black community to you know, come on board and to actually work on, on the projects. Um, just to also talk about my experience as a black graduate student. Um, so as a female black, as a black female graduate student in UBC, um, I've, sometimes I feel that we don't have adequate support to, you know, to help us through the grad, graduate journey. Um, and that makes an already lonely graduate journey an even lonelier one. So it's, you know, I often have to rely on friends and informal support systems or find creative ways to, you know, to achieve my goals or to, uh, my personal and professional goals. Um, or like, you know, having formal support systems out there that, you know, show you, that help, you know, guide you, um, you know, towards achieving your goals. And I feel that, um, I, it's, for me, it's even more worrisome uh, uh, because when I look around, I see very few black professors who can provide that much needed guidance and support, who can take on the role of confident friend, or what we call the Nigeria school parents, you know, people who can advise you and you know, take, you, take you in as uh, one of theirs to actually guide you throughout through the unwritten rules of ac academia and the graduate life, having been you know, in my shoes before. So having that will be, will be very useful to us. And that's why I'm grateful that we have the, the Black Caucus today, which is, was re recently established. And I believe that, that the Black Caucus will, form, will be that um, community we're looking for, for black students, faculty, and staff. And um, so I'm hopeful that that would um, be able to help us to achieve a lot in the long run. But I know that it goes beyond the Black Caucus. The city of Vancouver and UBC also has a lot to do in ensuring that you know, black students, staff, faculty, and members of the general black community feel safe and included you know, in Vancouver. And I believe it starts first and foremost with listening to our concerns, our fears, and, I hope, and our hopes. And I hope that um, the oncoming um, strategy being worked on by the city will be useful in, ad in addressing that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I moved here to Vancouver about 17 years ago, and I'm originally from New York and grew up in Brooklyn, born and bred. Every day that I'd wake up on my block, black people every day. I mean, walking to the subway, getting on the subway, and then of course, as we gradually would get to Manhattan, um, the cars would change in terms of the demographics. And that's just it, and if, you know, there's gentrification going on and all of that, and that's all fine. And when I moved here, I actually took that particular daily experience for granted. Um, because when I moved here, I mean, I had visited and I had seen a couple of black people and had no idea that it was so completely different from anything that I had experienced. So moving here, what I needed to find was a way to connect and see other black faces mm -hmm. in terms of absorbing energy, in mm -hmm. terms of points of reference, in terms of just having a conversation that unfortunately many times there were there are a number of friends that I have that are white, but lots of times the conversation will always end up being about race. And it's like, you know, there's a lot going on here. And it's not that uh, conversations about race are not important. It's just that when I want to have that conversation, and particularly when there are issues of um, anti-black racism that does occur on a daily basis here, I really was looking for a network. Mm -hmm. um, and also because I was working in arts and culture. And here in arts and culture where I started working, um, I started working at, I volunteered everywhere because that's my way of getting to know people and getting to know a city. Um, although my husband is black, a lot of the people that he works with as a musician and as a stage manager, many of the people that he works with are white and they're all wonderful and great but he has been in Vancouver for a really long time. Mm -hmm. I had just moved here. Um, I was so, I didn't realize how desperate I was mm -hmm. until I would see some really corny commercials on TV 
that had black people on it. <laughs> and it was like, look, there's one of us. I mean, mm -hmm. I, seriously. I, mm -hmm. And as a result of that sort of drought and constantly calling my family, mm -hmm. um, constantly just looking for connections, um, I was working for the Vancouver International Film Festival. I was a filmmaker for 11 years, um, taking films all across the United States and also working in theater and off-Broadway as a stage manager and a production manager as, and a lighting technician. So I, I come from it from a number of perspectives. So while I was with VIF and working with them, and I also became the managing director of the Folk Music Festival after a while. Um, so I got to see a lot of things. Um, and realizing that as a result of the networks that I was building and the resources that I was building while I was here, that I could then create a situation where it would make my heart feel well. But I thought, you know what, I can't be the only person that's going through this here. Mm -hmm. Because although I love VIF, I do love it. I think it is a fantastic festival and I love the people that work there. There were not, for me, enough stories from the African diaspora that were being represented that make my heart happy. Yeah. So I went to the artistic director of VIF, Alan Franey at the time, and I said, Alan, it's time that we have a Black History Month film series here. And he's like, all right, good. I was timing, good luck, or whatever the universe put together to say that that was absolutely fine. So that is exactly what I did, and that was eight years ago. So that film series has been in effect for eight years at the Van City Theater. And when I moved to Granville Island, I then spread um, cultural activities to Granville Island that included um, uh, events such as Afro Hair Savoir Faire, which was a, an event that, that celebrated the glory of black hair, whatever state it was in. Because I'd notice, and I am a dual citizen now, and I'm, I'm happy to be a dual citizen, um, but here on the West Coast, I noticed that a number of black women were not, when they would talk about their hair, it was like in whispers, or they'd always make sure that they were someplace else where they were talking about it, as if talking about our hair in whatever state it was in was something that was not something we were supposed to do in public. And I'm like, I just don't get this. I don't, I don't understand this. So um, together with Vanessa Richards, and a number of you probably know Vanessa, we put together Afro Hair Savoir Faire, which I brought in films about black hair, I also brought in a number of black estheticians so that they could then um, be promoted to, because we're always looking for places to get our hair did. Mm -hmm. And I know that was an issue for me because you know my hair is natural and came here and I had to keep sending back to the States to get, just to get things for my hair. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm thinking? This is supposed to be a major metropolitan city. <laughs> Right, it's a port city. And I know that there are black people here, but when we'd go to the shops and see in London Drugs or, and I know it's not all of the London Drugs, but London Drugs or shoppers, you'll go and there are not, there are not any products for our hair or if there are products, the products are something that we probably were using back in 1980 something. Mm -hmm. and. And I'm just thinking from a retail experience, from just a business perspective, that just doesn't make any sense to me. So through the community work I do, yeah, some of it is really um, self-initiated, but I feel as if there are quite a number of black women and men that feel exactly the same way because it is about feeling as if you really are a part of this community. Mm -hmm. If you really are a part of this community, all of these issues in terms of cultural expression through stories, and our stories are from all over the world, our stories are from all over Canada, they are from all over Vancouver. And all of our stories, if they are not being told, in a way it means as if you don't think we actually exist. Mm -hmm. So in terms of establishing our existence, I have 
come to the point, well, I've always been this way in a way, of just <laughs> going ahead and doing it myself. But that's just me. Um, but I've been able to connect with quite a number of um, people here. Kona is definitely at the top of that list. She recruited me from one of the parties I was throwing for VIF. She saw me, she was like, I never saw you before. You <laughs> need to come. <laughs> Isn't no, that where was it? Was it there? Where? Where? Oh, it was it's the city of it Vancouver was the thing. Arts Awards. That's right, at 560. And I saw you and Wayne walk in. I was like, who's that tall black woman? I've never seen her before. And I marched over and I'm like, who are you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come that's, with me. That, Come, that's with me. A Come with me. Come with me. moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, there are still quite a number of issues. I have really taken my career um, into my own hands. Um, in terms of just make, making sure that I can have a sustainable career in arts and culture. Um, have worked many, many festivals. Um, on the boards of a couple of festivals, have started a number of festivals where it would bring either marginalized people together or anybody and everybody together because culturally our stories are important, our existence is important, and as a way of establishing our own, I, if I can, through networking and through resources, will grab it and put it together um, either by myself or through the resources and networking that I've established here. And what is really important as a result, I walk up to black people on the street all the time and I say, mm -hmm. you know what, there's only eight of us here mm -hmm. and I know you must be new mm -hmm. because I've never seen you before. Mm -hmm. So I'm Barbara Chirinos. Who are you? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, of course, there are the black people that you do that to, and they're like, mm -hmm. and they're just continue, and that's like mm -hmm. fine, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead. There are the people that will not sit next to you on the bus. There's a little 80-year-old woman on the bus, mm -hmm. bus is crowded, seat next to me is quite empty, and this is a bus I would get on every single day to go to work. And I'm pretty sure I've seen this woman before, this seat is, if, if there were no seats available, I would have gotten up. I say she's 80, I don't know, she could be 100. I don't know how <laughs> old she was, but she was old. And if I, as I said, if, my, if there were no seats, I would have given her my seat. However, this was the only seat that was empty. She decided to stand with her cane, mm -hmm. and then a seat opened up in the back of the bus, and then there she goes, you know, and I just like watched her and uh, the people around us were watching her too. As she is tripping back and forth on the bus to go all the way to the back to avoid sitting to me, sitting next to me. And here I am just going to work. And I am like, really? What is it that you think I am either going to do to you or can do to you and this is 2017, 2018, 2019. So through the work that I do, I also do it because it helps me to keep my sanity. Mm -hmm. um, it also helps me to keep my calm. What I also notice is when these events happen, the joy that I see that comes across from the people of African descent when they get together. It can be a movie that is as corny as all get out. It can be really old or it can be something that is as relevant as I am not your, I am not your Negro. I am the person that originally brought that film to Vancouver mm. and then it spread all over the place. There are a number of films that I've brought here to Vancouver that are black stories that I've originally brought here and I will take credit for that mm -hmm. and then have spread throughout the Lower Mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very proud of it, but what I am particularly proud of is after the film is over, well, I love the opening remarks I get to make because my people let me talk forever, which is wonderful. But afterwards, everyone has an opportunity to exhale. Everyone has an opportunity to just, it's okay to speak your truth here mm. because we get you. You know, no one's going to ask, are you sure you weren't? <laughs> you know, slow your roll. You know, yeah, you know, mm. I've been told to slow my roll for I don't even know as soon as I moved here. I'm like, I don't know how. No, you don't. I don't, I don't know how. But that is what brings me joy. 
And the next step for me is to pass that on along with the skills that I've learned in terms of networking and resourcing and working as a mentor and also working to make sure that our histories are included in the curriculum. And if it is not included in the cur curriculum, then we create our own curriculum for our own separate schools until it is accepted in the curriculums because not only do there are many that are our age, our age that do not know African Canadian history, African American history, African history, African European history, there's a lot that we don't know. And it's not because we don't want to know. It's because it is not being included because again, as visible minorities, unfortunately we are very invisible. And knowing that, just moving on and making sure that the stories, our histories, are passed on to the next generation, but not only the next generation of our children, because our history is also world history. It is the history of this planet. We have contributed either through arts and culture, inventions, science, astrology, all of it, just like all of the other cultures that are on this planet. And we also need to get our due and credit for it. And that's what moves me in terms of my community work. Yeah. Yes. Is that good? <laughs> Love you. Oh, I just supposed to jump in? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Kona. Uh, I have lived here in Vancouver, British Columbia. I moved here in 1997 um, and I moved from the place where I was born, which is Treaty 6 land, uh, the ancestral land of the Enoch Cree, which is colonially known as Edmonton, Alberta. My, I'm the first person on several in several generations on both sides of my parents' family to be born outside of Guyana, South America. Guyana has, um, was so heavily colonized that it is the only country in all of South America that has English as its first language. Um, in that place, in my lineage, is uh, the blood of the Wapinashu indigenous people of that place. And uh, my family was heavily slaved throughout the Caribbean, and so I don't know where my ancestors were actually snatched from. Um, I came here in 1997 and um, very quickly became a community organizer, a facilitator, uh, I'm an artist. Um, I've done 15 years as a municipal cultural facilitator in the Lower Mainland area. Um, I've done, I did six years at the BC Human Rights Commission in its previous incarnation. I was there on the very last day when the previous incarnation got shut down and there was sort of four of us and one desk, one phone, they were taking the photocopier out, we were s drinking beers in, there was only one chair. Um, and they made us stay the whole day, all of us, they made us stay the whole day. Um, and for 30 years I've done passion pro so prior to my even coming to Vancouver, um, for over 30 years I've engaged in passion projects that meet at the intersection of um, orientation, identity, power, race, sex positivity, arts, culture, and um, I, I feel really honored to have had that opportunity. Um, in, the, in the beginning of my community I, d I don't call myself an activist. Mm -hmm. I refer to myself as a highly engaged citizen. <laughs> um, sometimes I call myself an agitator. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think of myself as an ag activist. I think mm -hmm. of myself more as a person who inserts herself into everywhere. I feel comfortable doing that because I was in grade 11 in Edmonton, Alberta before I went to school with another black person other than my brother, which is to say this is the 80s before I went to school with another black person outside my brother. I moved here in 1997. It was another five years before I finally worked for the first time in my professional career. And I'd had, at that point, you know, I was 32 at that time. I'd had business cards since I was 19. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in my life, I worked with a black person. Mm -hmm. I was 32. 
So I'd literally been working for almost 15 years. And that was here in Vancouver. Uh, in those early years of my arrival here in Vancouver when I was doing a lot of community organizing, it was primarily within com queer community. And at the time, it's a very different kind of politic right now, but at the time, a lot of queer activism was about the body. We were coming out of the mm -hmm. 80s, which was you know the time of AIDS, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of art that was being done. I was highly engaged in arts and culture um, from the time that I was a mid-teen, starting my first theater company when I was 17, in fact. Um, and so there was a lot of work around the body. When I got to Vancouver and became really immersed in the queer community here, I went to everything. I went, I literally went to everything. And part of the reason I went every weekend to everything was because I was always the only black person present. And what I knew was that I didn't, what I, was that I wanted to be present in the room in case another black person came in the door. Mm -hmm. What I didn't want to have happen is that they were having the experience that I was having. And so literally, year after year after year, I was going to events and really being the only black person present at those queer events. I did a lot of organizing in that queer community on both sides of the border as an educator um, and, and doing events. Um, for almost 10 years, I ran the only women's bathhouse in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was one more in Halifax, and I think maybe one in Toronto for a couple of years, but nobody, they were sort of, those were sort of, a, there were a few years, they lasted for a few years, so I did that for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and there came a point uh, when I realized that while I was doing a lot in community, while I was, when I looked around, what I saw were white people. And so the money I was donating, the money I was taking out of my pockets to create events that there could be community happening in, the time I was taking, the sleepless nights, the lugging of Rubbermaid containers of shit yeah. at two in the morning, yeah. tearing the parties down, yeah. was for white people. It wasn't for black people. In 2016, I guess it was, um, what I call the summer of killing black people, mm -hmm. which is when social media really started flipping uh, black killing porn. I'd open up my social every day and there was all this black death. And there was, um, at one point, there was a, a vigil that was held here at the Vancouver art gallery. At the time, my brother's child had come to live with me, Morgan, um, and I was uncertain as to whether or not I'd like her, so I basically like invited all my friends and was like, okay, you gotta like meet this person, she's, you know, like, we gotta raise her, she was 18, I'm like, we got a year to raise her to adulthood to make her a good person, and I really want to make sure that if I didn't like her, she'd still have people that would support her, because if they supported me, they would support her. As it turns out, I love her to pieces, and she's fantastic. She's an amazing human being. <laughs> I do remember, however, two distinct things there that really speak to the kind of um, cognitive dissonance and, and, and disembodiment and amnesia that we have here in Canada when it comes to being a black person. Um, one was that I sort of invited a bunch of black people over to my house and was like, Morgan, here are all the black people I know. And she looked at me at one point, and there's maybe about eight people in the room. Let's be clear, I have worked hard, much like going up to you at a, an event where I didn't know you, I've literally worked hard to fill my life with black people. Mm -hmm. And Morgan turned to me and said, Auntie, I've never been in a room with so many black people. She's 18 years old, and there's eight people in the room born and raised in Canada. We had another conversation where she said to me, Auntie, do you have a, a good recipe for like, I think it was um, biscuits and grits or something? And I was like, what? And she's like, well, I wanna, cause she was raised in a non-black um, uh, household. Um, uh, her, cause she was raised with her mother who's white. Um, and I was like, she said, I wanna know the food of my people. And I was like, number one, that's U.S. Southern food. That ain't our food. And there was this look, and I will never ever forget the look on her face where it became clear that 
um, how she understood herself potentially mm -hmm. as a black person came mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. was mediated through the media. Mm -hmm. And it came through very much a, a US centric way of being. Mm -hmm. It once again underscored for me how being a black Canadian, it, to be a black Canadian is to not be seen for who we are in this place and how we exist in this place and what our lives are in this place, what the reality of being here is, but is to be mediated through what is the experience in the US. It is for one, it is one of, and it is for that reason that when BLM, when Black Lives Matter Vancouver started in, uh, started up here, people, because I'm just around, I'm always inserting myself, you know, because I was born in the whiteness, and I don't mean just the snow of Alberta, and because I was the only black person in my friend group, look, I learned how to be Barbecue Becky, right? What, is, what that means is I never got the key, like aside from the piece where my mother said, you take your, your wallet with you and you never leave the house. I remember the first time I did that and I didn't. I was actually working at the, at the Human Rights Commission and was leaving for lunch, realized I didn't, ha I, I literally burst into tears. Mm -hmm. I was a full grown adult woman. I was like, I can't believe I've done this. Um, but it means that I never, I didn't grow up with the message that you can't ask for the manager. Cause, so I will ask for the manager? Every time, I will call the, I will go up to the police officer and I will have that conversation because it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't really, I don't, I, I don't see myself foremost as black that way because of how I was raised. And it was coming to Vancouver and being surrounded by Asian people where I realized I couldn't read, I, that I had, um, um, I had racial ignorance. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, now I can tell sort of Chinese, Korean, like I can kind of do that now, but I had zero, I had zero at the time. But when BLM came to be, I, they, um, people were constantly um, assuming that I was part of BLM, in part because they're not very, there's only, would you say eight of us in the city? Um, we are starving and malnourished in the city. We don't mm -hmm. see a lot of, we don't see a lot of, um, our faces on the stages or in offices or in retail establishment establishments. And um, for that reason, I did a project a few years ago that I called Counting Black People, where I literally counted black people when I went out into Vancouver. And on major streets, Granville, Hastings, Commercial Drive, Kingsway, those kinds of things. There was one extraordinary day, it was a hot sunny day, I was down at the beach and I counted over, I stopped counting at like 130. I was wow. like, this is amazing. Wow. It was hot. That's a lot. It was hot. People are out recharging their melanin. Oh were, they on the, were they on the cruise ship? Did Part, they no, no, away? no, they were actually oh, okay. out in the world. <laughs> but other than that, other than that, the most people I would see would be 10. On an average day, I would see three. Um, currently what I do is my community, my current community initiative that I do is with my niece Morgan, it's an intergenerational project called Black Chat. It runs on three th streams of programming. There's family style gatherings called, that take place in my home, uh, called Black Chat. Uh, uh, Barbara's been several times. Um, there are, there's a, uh, um, that sort of got to be too much and too full. So then we started doing uh, community field trips called Black Attacks. This uh, handle was talking about the show that was at the Chan this past Saturday. The Chan gave me 40 tickets for free. They're valued at like 50 to 88 bucks. Gave me 40 tickets and we took a pile of black people. Um, and the third piece that we, um, because that actually got to a point where it was just a lot and lots of people wanted access. And now we also do a podcast, which is also called, called Black Chat. Look it up, you know, on whatever you listen to a podcast um, where we are unapologetically black. And I think that's where I will end. I mean, I kind of want to talk about other things, but I will stop there. Um, uh, Thanks, folks. I, I guess from what you've heard, you can understand why this was sort of my dream team of how I could bring diversity of blackness and, and ways of thinking about blackness. Um, I think there might be cue cards that are going around, but um, before we get to those questions, I, I just wanted to make some links between what different people um, um, said. Do um, it. Omi, sorry, you really emphasize so much the idea of, uh, uh, 
of how anti-black racism works and, and forms of uh, isolation and tokenism um, uh, in the university. And I just wanted folks to understand that here, those things are heightened. They're like, mm -hmm. you know, multiplied several times, not only in the academy, but out in the community yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and so that, that's one of the things that sort of occurred to me. It's almost like um, black folks in other places with all the problem that you have, have a kind of privilege maybe of numbers that make some sense. People kept repeating how few people there are and how we begin to try. To, the, the black nod means so much more in Vancouver than it does in Toronto, for example, <laughs> right? Um, how much more we need to reach out. Um, I, I almost usually, I'm sorry for my Nigerian connection with I almost want to call you Olu each time. But but you don't go with Olu, you go with the last part, yeah? Dolapo. Dolapo, yeah, right? Because right. these, uh, we we also have these ni uh, Nigerian names in Sierra Leone. So to you, I would be Kashope from now on. Right? <laughs> so one of the things you mentioned so much was this isolation of black students. In mm. fact, something and I share, which make a lot of black people in North America uncomfortable, yeah. is this idea of we had to learn to become black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Some people feel yeah. very uncomfortable with that. You mentioned it, I've talked about it in my own work, uh, and every day I'm learning. The last time mm. we were here, somebody talked about people teaching their kids the black nod. I'm saying, oh, you have to tell your children this. Yeah. I barely have learned it myself, right? So, so th there are ways in which we are coming in. Well, you came into blackness roaring, right? <laughs> Making a huge intervention already in the city of Vancouver with that report of yours, and I recommend it to people still. And it reminds me that there was work that black students had done, right? Um, Barbara, you mentioned this, this kind of lack of talking, to, speaking to, to, uh, to blackness, to black studies, the need for black studies, for African studies, all those kinds of things. Africa awareness was the student group that made it possible for UBC to actually have a minor in, in African mm. studies. Mm. It was those students' activism that did that. Mm. So the power of students mm. and student voices to me is really important. Mm. And these forms of isolation that people feel, and the way that that is multiplied so many times, if you think about queer blackness, right? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to straight blackness and some kind of taking for granted ways of being in the world. I think all of that was so important to bring out um, uh, on, a, on a day like today. And, and just to remind ourselves, we're in the presence of uh, a chair of black studies. I, I will keep coming back to that. Right? <laughs> yeah, we, we have UBC, we have SFU, we have UVic. We have no such thing, right? <laughs> That's how little we think of, uh, of black studies uh, in the province, right? So mm -hmm. uh, she's here as a living rebuke. <laughs> uh, to, I think to, to the province and what ought to be happening. Um, and I, I, I want to stop there. The, the, the cue cards might be coming, but I wanted if each of you can maybe say something about how you see um, diversity within blackness or diversity uh, in community and what that means for your own work and your own presence. You know, if each of diversity you within black community? Yeah, the kind, of, the kind of diversity that we don't always talk about. You know, like the difference between people who've come from the Caribbean as opposed to, I mean, when I spoke with uh, Marcus uh, mm -hmm. on Saturday, for example, mm -hmm. he gave a whole way of talking about his blackness coming from Texas, the rural south. Mm -hmm. And I had to say, and, and we both came to Canada mm -hmm. at around the same time in the 1980s. And I had to say, my, 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 he was already very, very black and came to a place where he's thinking, oh, how can you be black here? And I came saying, how can I be black here too? Because I came from a place where yeah. blackness was not important, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Ethnicity was important. I'm not saying yeah. we don't have discrimination. You have discrimination based on ethnicity. Yeah. What ethnic group do you belong to? Right. We have, but, but there are ways in which we are different in our blackness, and we don't, 
we don't feel comfortable engaging that. I always want to open up a discussion about that because some people feel that it erases the unity. I don't feel mm -hmm. it does. I feel sometimes you can have a, a black event that actually, for example, there was the Latin, Latin American fi Film Festival and Barbara came up to speak and I said, what the hell does she have to do with Latin America, right? <laughs> right. And I, it turns out, she, <laughs> I, I am Afro-Latina and my, Which I never knew. <laughs> my, grand, my, my mother is from Nicaragua and my dad was from Honduras. And my grandfather, uh, my paternal grandfather is full-blooded Mosquito Indian. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on in here. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, before the, before social media and your image was quite prevalent, and it mm -hmm. still happens now though, when people see my name, even though I've married twice, I refuse to change my name because I love it. I absolutely love my name. But they'd see my name and they had no idea what I was. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of doors that I was actually able to get through. I may mm -hmm. speak to them on the phone, that still didn't tell them anything. Mm -hmm. And um, still to this day, when there are people that meet me and they see my name, they think, they, you know, they say Chirinos and they think, oh, well, they, if they know something, they'll know that it's either a Latin name or it's really Hispanic, or they think it's Greek. Right. Yeah. And then I walk in the door. Yeah. And... Then it's back to what, what Omi Shire was saying about being surprised that blackness is in the space, inhabiting the space, taking yeah. up space. Yeah. Absolutely, and there are significant differences. Mm -hmm. The food's different yeah. because our the, the food, even though most of it is African based, but the food is quite different. And also because of the part of Brooklyn where I grew up, there were Latinos and there were also people from the Caribbean. So, and then also people from um, the Southern states of the United States. And so there are really quite a number of differences in terms mm -hmm. of approach um, and attitude, but it was attitude with an accent, but it was still attitude. Oh, yeah. You're so good. <laughs> <laughs> but most definitely differences. <laughs> but here, I don't think people are ready for it. Yeah. You know, they see black and it's like, yeah. black, that's it. Yeah. Did you want to do some questions? Yeah, questions. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So questions. Let's we start. Let's start with you. Oh uh, dear. Yes. Okay. So one question for you: What do you say back to institutions who refuse to see racism uh, as a health and safety issue? Yo, yo, at um, their peril, at their peril. <laughs> the H and S <laughs> advisory committee of my union rejects the inclusion of racism as a mental health hazard. Yes. You know, on, um, what's that TV show called? Can it's you give us more information? It's a hospital one. It's not St. Elsewhere. It's Grey's Anatomy? Grey's Anatomy. No, no, no. It's, sorry? St. Elsewhere? No, it's recent. Like, mm -hmm. the, it's only in its third season. Oh, Amsterdam? Thank you, New Amsterdam. <laughs> New Amsterdam. Y'all right. don't watch TV? <laughs> <laughs> So on a recent episode of New Amsterdam, the child psychologist um, had a young black child in his care, and the black child had benign tumors developing throughout his body. So after engaging in some talk therapy, the white child psychologist said, this is how this is developing because the child is attempting to address the anti-black racism that they're experiencing in their lives. I'm sorry, on TV this was? Yeah. No, seriously. This is why I call it research. Oh. Because moments like this happen and then I can write about it and I get a publication. Anyway, and so, um, and so in the episode, the white, child, the white child psychologist is now attempting to work with the coding system of the hospital to say, we need to code this as racism and then put in a plan in place to manage the tumors as they continue to develop, mm -hmm. but also intervene through anti-black racism. And the hospital administrator is like, administrator is like, well, you can't code for racism. You can't, like, how is racism a health thing? 
So I work in the Faculty of Medicine and you know, the talk I was doing at the University of Victoria last week mapped out the history, uh, a truncated history of colonialism and anti-black racism and how it impacts w how we currently understand health and wellness today. It's part of the work that I'm doing in blood donation as well. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that you know, we have the Samuel Cartwrights of the world, the Marianne Sims who purchased enslaved black women for the sole purposes of um, ex uh, experimenting on them in what we today would call gynecology. Um, and all of the other, you know, Sarah Bartman, Henrietta Lacks, like there's just lots of ways in which black people have, you know, uh, Castor Semenya, Serena Williams, there's just lots of ways in which black people um, are positioned, are scienced into degradation. Yes. Um, and so, hmm. So often when I speak with medical professionals, I talk about how racism uh, impacts their patients. And they, they're often, you know, what are you talking about? It's science, like it's math. Like what do you mean it impacts our patients? And so I translate that to speak about how the impacts of racism would manifest in this language they may call stress. And so it raises the, um, it, it has a physiological, um, a physiological action on the body, yeah. which causes us to heal slower from surgery, yeah. which causes us to metabolize medications differently, which causes, so it, ca it has this cascading effect. And so there's this, you know, on one hand in public health, people will talk this, about the social determinants of health gender, race, right? And then say, but we don't understand why black people are non-compliant, and we don't understand why black people don't come in the hospital, yeah. and we don't understand why black people don't A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah. And here, give us research funds so we can go into black communities and teach black people in a really development model the proper way to behave and be so they can get healthcare. They don't get research funds, I've had a number turned down, um, to study the, the levels and the impacts of racism, because as every peer reviewer has said on my, as different peer reviewers, every peer reviewer has said on my research uh, grants that have been turned down, you are assuming racism exists. Mm -hmm. And this is not an objective stance to take. And so they've marked it low. And so what would I say? So uh, if we look at a harm reduction model, then you, then I would say, you know, work with a group of people, pull out the stats, indicate that there's a dearth of research in Canada focusing on black people and health outcomes. So pull from the United States, pull from the UK, and then push to have, um, to have uh, the university add to their EAP or the EPA, whatever they call it, um, black uh, mental health experts, right? Black uh, uh, physiotherapists, black uh, chiropractors, push, push to have that done. That could be a harm reduction model. But on the other hand, the part where you're, we're working for our own liberation with one another, because my liberation is bound up in yours, right? In that part, then um, the, those are the pieces where you are doing direct action and intervention with health authorities, with Health Canada, with other places, whilst also crowdsourcing for support and interventions within our own communities. And so one of the reasons I left Vancouver was because I couldn't see myself. And Kona will tell you this. Yeah. There were times I was walking down the street and when black people walked by me as if they didn't see me, yeah. I lost my MF mind. I and I would, I, would, I would go, you know, yeah. ham. And I would literally yell out at them, I see you. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, but I. Boo, mm -hmm. I see you, right? Because I could not, it was so, is there still a TD? on Burrard and Davy. Yes. Yeah. Right, you see those big glass plates, right? I would go to Burrard and Davy and stand in front of those glasses, that glass window, just to confirm that I cast a reflection. Yeah. Because the erasure of my presence yeah. was so profound yeah. that it was 
leeching marrow from my bones, yes. which is, I don't even know if I said goodbye to you. I think I just sent no. you an email. I'm in Toronto now. Yeah, I was yeah. mad. I remember that I was mad. But well, I mean, I, together now. But you know, but here's the thing though, right? Is that uh, what, I, what I respect when people don't do the nod or where they avert their eyes is it's actually not safe. Mm -hmm. Often they're, by, often they're with their white friends mm -hmm. or friends, you know, non-black friends. Yeah. And what I recognize is it's not safe. When I am with my friends and I'm nodding, I do this, my, my white friends, you know that person? I'm like, no, well, then why? It's like, like I don't wanna have that conversation with you, actually. Yeah. And so I can imagine if I'm walking down and I'm do, by myself and I do that to somebody, it's not safe. I don't yeah. know what's happening there. And there is also the thing that happens um, when there are groups of black people, and I don't know, I mean, Toronto seems to be a different town. I w like, when I went there, I was like, what is this mystery? Because being a Western Canadian black person, I don't know anything except how to be the raisin in the oatmeal. <laughs> but, you know, I'm aware that, um, like, if there's two or more of us, or three of us, like, I get together with, like, like B and I have been out in a restaurant laughing, and the two of us, our laughs compete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the people around us can't manage. Okay, the Chinese right? food so when, restaurant so when, we so went when, to, right? The Chinese food restaurant we went to when I was here in the summer, yeah. and the white table that was behind us, and then the white guy that had to say to us, I just want to say your laughs are so, whatever. He got pleasure yeah, yeah, yeah. from us. Yeah. And you said, rightfully, what portion of our meal are you purchasing? Uh. Uh -huh. Because clearly, we, we, there is an exchange here. Like if I've, if I've provided entertainment, mm -hmm. you, pay me. You have provided a service. Pay me. And he came over to acknowledge yes. that the service we provided was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so you said, rightfully, how are you going to pay for that? And he was so taken aback, he was like, what? And we were like, no, no, we're not here for free entertainment. Mm -hmm. Right? There is a cost to this. I think, there's a, I think there's a cost for black people being in groups. I do, but that cost is from the passcodes from back in the day, sure. right? Like Vancouver had um, city limit laws that black people couldn't be within the city limits of Vancouver after a period of time. Black people and South Asian people, right? Um, same with Halifax, same with, um, same with London, Ontario. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, so, so wow. these, these, this is part of this colonial project that's just kind of moving. A, like from Upper Canada, Lower Canada, then out to the oceans, right? Like this is how that's I think, working. I, I think Handel has questions. Oh, I think, yeah, I, yeah. I think we're, we're virtually out of time, oh, by the way. I know. So I yeah. can, can okay. uh, Barbara and um, Delapo, this one might go for the two of you. Can you address specifically, this is for black women on the panel, what it means being a woman and being black, what, how does that particular racism work and how do you counter it? Mm. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna talk about that from the perspective of uh, students. Um, so I'm a black graduate, female student at, at um, UBC. And one thing about that is um, I always have to be conscious about my actions. So, Generally, I'm a very passionate person. I like to talk. I like to, you know, really engage people in discussions. But then, whenever I'm in a crowd, I always have to be conscious about, you know, my actions not being taken as aggressive, you know, so that I won't be labeled, you know, the angry black woman and things like that. So I, I have to be conscious about my actions, you know, generally. Um, the other thing that concerns me is, you know, one of the statistics that I found was, you know, when you look at the earnings. Um, rates of all ethnic groups and races across Canada, black women have, you know, end the list. So that's another concern that I have personally. So it just shows that um, these issues uh, um, of anti-black racism play out in various ways in different capacities, whether you're a student, whether you're a, a worker, um, any, any, any way you, in different, you know, facets. Mm. So that's why it's important to, um, know these things, recognize the challenges we have, and then um, look for ways to, you know, to address it. Um, I also wanted to just add something to the question Handel asked initially about the, you know, diversity among, amongst us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that surprised me while I was doing this project was, you know, I interviewed someone and, 
you know, he mentioned that, you know, some people would be offended to be referred to as black, that they prefer to be called African Canadians or Caribbean Canadians or things like that. And I realized that there was a lot of contention even amongst us, you know, within the community. And this was reinforced when I spoke to a couple of city staff who also mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of division amongst us. So it's when, when that happens and different, you know, different, you know, uh, factions come, you know, to make demands of the city. They don't know which one to, you know, give, you know, um, attention to because, you know, you have right, left, and centre. Different factions are coming to make similar demands. So one thing I realise is there's a need for us to be to act as one. And that's a very, very important um, step for us as, you know, as a black community. We all have different. We're, we're all. We, like, I, I like to think about this analogy that Trevor Noah gave, he told the story about his, um, his brother, you know, how his brother was, because he's, you know, um, half, he's mixed, mm -hmm. he's a mixture of, you know, black and white, and his brother, you know, is black. So he was telling his, you know, you know, his brother was telling his friend about how, you know, you can have a white chocolate, dark chocolate, you know, uh, you know, cream chocolate, but, you know, it's all Nestle. So it's exactly the same thing. We're all part of the black community. We're all part of that. Unit. So we should all come together to make a strong demand, and that's when we talk about activism. That's how it works. United we stand, divided we fall. So this is, you know, uh, for me, it's a crucial, it's a crucial um, issue that we all have to take into consideration. Okay. So, um, well, okay. you can either answer that or you can answer the follow-up, which is hilarious. What connects? Because this is a really interesting question. So, what actually connects the black diaspora in Vancouver? Oh. Since we have no place, we have no <laughs> neighborhood, right? So in your, uh, in your view, what connects the black? You and your God, well? Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> um, we connect. That, that's really what the connection is, because we actually have to create the connection. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. There's no one that's out there that's going to make the connection for us. Mm -hmm. um, it r translates back to your original question that you had in terms of how am I, what was the question? How am I a black woman mm -hmm. in this place? Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, I learned a really, really long time ago mm -hmm. when I had an issue with being tall. Mm -hmm. I thought that if I you know, would walk over, if mm -hmm. I would shorten myself a little bit, that I wouldn't appear as tall as I was. And I realized it's like, no matter what I do, I'm always going to be tall. Mm -hmm. No matter what I do, I am going to be black. Mm -hmm. I am going to stand out here and people are going to judge me whether, no matter what, whether I'm, you know, the, 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 the things that you're supposed to do as a professional, there are a number of us that do those things and you still don't get the job. 100%. And you still, and you, you still don't get the promotion. Mm -hmm. And it is because, and it can be because you're black, no matter what. People, as my mother used to say, people are gonna talk about you no matter what you do. Um, mm -hmm. And I have come to, whether or not this is far left, far right, however you'd like to want to take it, um, what you think of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. It truly isn't. I cannot be concerned with what other people think of me. What mm -hmm. I am concerned about is how I can be um, a positive contributor to the black community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the difficult thing in terms of uh, being together, and I, I do hear what you're saying in terms of thinking together, but we're all from different places. Mm -hmm. we, you know, black people are not a monolith. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we don't expect white people to be a monolith. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, everybody has their own different political ideas, feminist, um, whether or not they're not feminists, yeah. whether or not they're activists. We don't expect other people from other ethnicities to be monolithic, but yeah. there's a huge pressure on people of African descent to, you know, we can't, if we don't all get along, we're not going to move further, mm -hmm. but why is it for specifically for the black mm -hmm. community that we are not, supposedly, we are not advancing, supposedly, mm -hmm. meanwhile, we have doctor, <laughs> PhD, PhD student, yeah. 
community activist, agitator, all around fantastic person here. Yeah, fire, pure fire. Another professor here. Yeah. Right. We are not advancing because we are not together, but we're the only ethnic group that is expected to be a monolith when it's virtually impossible. And this and this is the this is why respectability politics costs us our lives. Exactly. Right? And so regardless oh, please of please say ten more words. Yeah, so you know, regardless of how you know Regardless of whether or not we speak, we speak in a particular way, we're engaged in a particular way, whether we never raise our voice, whether we, you know, if we are not, if we are not entertaining to white people, mm -hmm. right, this is how white supremacy works, mm -hmm. then we are a danger. Yes. And this is what this image really shows me, and I, uh, and I think about it in terms of, whether or not we're committed, how we think about diversity inclusion, equity, diversity, inclusion. And so for some folks, equity, diversity, inclusion is about focusing on that white woman and making sure that she's okay, right? Because she's clearly disturbed here, right? I mean, she is feeling disturbed. Look at her, she's disturbed. And so the work is, well, maybe she doesn't understand and maybe we should do work with her. I don't maybe care. we should do workshops with her. Maybe Look, we should she's do whatever, almost dead. Right? Like maybe we should do these things. But That's you see, the, for me, activist work, um, leading from social justice about the importance of black life is this black woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. This black woman is living her best life. Right? Mm -hmm. And so she knows that that woman's there, but she's, look at her, she flies, she in this crochet dress, mm -hmm. she has her thing, she's going to her next power meeting, and she she's going to take, her. right? Her yep. hair is on point. And she's she knows that, that and white she, woman's right? there. Yep. She knows the white woman's there, and she was like, my job is not to make that white woman feel comfortable with my presence. Mm -hmm. My job is to feel comfortable in my own presence. Mm -hmm. And this is why I draw so heavily on the Audre Lorde quote, right? right? right. And yes. so I, you know, I've done, I've worked in equity, diversity, and inclusion um, when I was at York University in the early 90s. And I, you know, the race and ethnic relations office and the sexual and gender diversity advisor. I worked in the similar office when I was at UBC, access and diversity, I don't know if it's still there or if it still does the same work. I remember doing workshops because that's what you did back in the day. And through the workshop, I never once used black people as an example, mm -hmm. right? I use Chinese people as an example, head tax, the way that um, model minority um, ism works on Chinese people, South Asian people, right? So I, I use that in the workshop. And without fail, my evaluations would say she focuses too much on black people hmm. because I was the one in the classroom, right? right? And so then I would go in and talk nothing about black people and actually do the workshop I wanted to do to disrupt anti-blackness. And then it was, she talks nothing about black people, but at least one was accurate. One was, so my decision to stop trying to interpret in a way that they would see me as palatable liberated me to do the work that I was doing. Absolutely. Which led to the fact that I actually, I actually have a job with black studies in the title. Like, who knew that could happen? Yeah. I actually have the job whose entire job is to be like, oh, I'm talking about black shit. Yeah. Oh, I'm talking about black shit today, tomorrow, the next day. Right on. That's, that's the exact um, apropos note on which to end this. <laughs> 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 uh, so I wanna, end, I wanna end with some thanks. Um, uh, the Equity and Inclusion Office, but especially after, yes, uh, yes. who's yes. done so much work with me, and Asmin, who helped her. Um, I believe Sarah Jane is, a, are you still around? Yeah, there's the AVP of Equity and Inclusion, Sarah Jane Finley, whose um, position makes all of this possible. Um, the Black Caucus, very ably, represented here today, um, and the Global Lounge, which is, and, and uh, Omi, sorry, I was saying I need to protect her. There were a number of things they wanted her to do, and I said, no, she's just coming in, doing this thing, 
and she volunteered <laughs> <laughs> to do more work. So she's, you know, she's doing a chat with graduate students at UBC. This that is so was very, very was you great. did it already. Yeah, we did it this yeah. afternoon. So it that, was that was so very, I think very it was generous. Good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I just, I enjoyed it. And I definitely <laughs> want to thank the panel again. You can understand maybe from this how. You know, if I just sit back, you can see why this was my dream May team. I just say thank you to yeah. one person? Yeah. I want to thank Ruth. <laughs> Hi. Ruth was an undergrad when I worked at UBC, and we did work together. A couple years, the two years I was there, we did work together on African, say it again? African awareness. African oh, yeah, awareness, African awareness. Yeah, right? So I think we brought yeah. Pablo in, Pablo mm -hmm. Udehosa, yeah. um, who's, at, who's at York. Mm -hmm. And so Ruth came up tonight, and I've been talking about her, I talked to her about her in the chair chat, about things that I remember from UBC. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't remember her name, but I remembered her. Mm -hmm. And so she came up tonight Aww. and she was like, do you remember me? And I knew exactly who she was, but her name was not in my head. Mm -hmm. But her as a person, you were in my head. So thank yeah. you for coming. And thank you for making my time at UBC good. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to all of you for being here on this wonderfully rainy day, night. Um, uh, it's, it takes a special kind of gumption to actually make it out on nights like this. I had to be here or else I would have been under the covers myself. So please join me once again in thanking um, uh, our esteemed panel. <laughs> so nice. So uh, and, and for all of us who continue to dare to be black beyond Ooh. the 28 days we yes. are assigned, Happy uh, black even though Month. every four years we get an extra day, um, and now we're even into March, and yet we dare to continue to dare. be black. Well, dare. Dare. You. <laughs> dare. You created every single day, and you know why February was selected. Because it's the shortest. No. No, no. It's the black man that created it. I know. Is, okay, yes. you know. Well, because, <laughs> tell them. Well, because February contains the birthdays oh, of Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln and Frederick, and Frederick Douglass. Douglass. So that yeah. is why February why has February. been selected, the month yeah. of black history. But we prefer the what story that birthday? they gave us the shortest what month. month. <laughs> My birthday? Yeah. I'm in April. Yeah. April? We should do May or Thank April. you very okay, much. Thank you very much, folks.